The Kinar craft is very delicate and time-consuming. Crafted objects have a wooden base on which numerous layers of paste are applied before it is smoothened and finely detailed, embossed and last painted. The level of detail can be explained through its past. The idols were originally made for the royalty and very wealthy and therefore the number one priority is finesse and detail instead of time efficiency. This allowed the incorporation of fine details usually seen in paintings, which is why the preparation of the surface of the wood is very similar to the processes used for paintings on flat wooden boards. Of course, there have been other influences, including regional arts, techniques and customs. Typical kina objects are large wooden religious idols and morals for temples. Like this one, in a small village temple near Kinal, where the priest is practicing the so-called puja or worship. Other typical themes are Kamarati, the god of love and his consort, the ten incarnations of Vishnu, scenes from the Ramayana and other ancient texts, Local deities like Kugama, Garuda, the vehicle of Lord Vishnu, Kamadenu, the one who grants wishes. By now, miniature idols and secular objects are also produced and sold into a domestic market. These secular, non-religious themes revolve around Palkis, which is a cradle for children, or used in religious processions, the chatris, which is a decorative umbrella, also used in religious processions, the chokis, a short-legged stool used to be eaten off or placed idols on, birds and animals, toys as well as decorative pieces, wall pieces, picture frames, mirror frames, fruit and vegetable trays, often used for prizes. As you can see, all objects reflect great detail and finesse. Most of the examples shown carry a modern day color palette which is chameleonic but painted with synthetic paints, causing a glossy look. The preference of aesthetics are a question of taste, but the color palette the craft began with was dedicated by the materials available. Here you can see a few examples of 200 year old work. Notice the dull surface. They are painted with vegetable and mineral colors like ochre, brick red, deep green, white, black and lapis, which act as fundamental colors to develop others. The most commonly seen motifs are floral, arabesque and creepers, used to decorate borders and corners. Prapabales or decorative arches use motifs like umbis or paisleys rosettes, lotuses and buds. Geometric patterns like basic stripes, checks, diamonds and dots are used to detail representations of fabric, fill in borders and backgrounds. But to truly appreciate the skill and the time put into each of these pieces, the process of the craft needs to be explained. The basic assembly has already been mentioned. Each piece has a wooden core, often consisting of several components. This core consists of porky wood, and this is what it looks like after it has been cut, dried, and is ready for use. It is a very light but low quality timber. In fact, it is only used for kinder craft, as even as firewood, it is unsuitable as it produces too much smoke. The trees are felled eight days before the full moon to prevent infects infesting the wood, they say. These planks of wood are cut into appropriately sized pieces for components. Craftsmen are often so experienced they do not even need to prepare a full size drawing for it, let alone templates. Assuming we are making a figure, 
The body is split into different components, which are fitted together when each part has been shaped. One reason for this is ease of accessibility and efficient use of timber. In fact, all offcuts are collected to be reused for smaller pieces and the sawdust is swept together to be reused in the tamarind paste. The pieces are cut and shaped using saw, chisel and file. In true Indian style, the craftsmen sit on the floor, cross-legged, and use their limbs to stabilize their workpiece. Once the parts are ready, they can be assembled using pins, nails and glue. After the glue has dried, the coarse tamarind paste is applied to the joints and the areas where the shape needs to be refined. This process involves first coating the surface with sticky tamarind gum, then the coarse paste, which consists of the same gum and sawdust, is netted into shape using the thumb. Once this layer is dry, it is filed smooth and the finer tamarind paste made from finer sawdust can be applied in a similar manner to build up detail such as facial features. These are iterative processes and it takes several refinements to create a perfect shape. Once satisfied, fine files and sandpaper are used to give it a smooth surface. Following on from this, the figure is covered in small pieces of cotton, usually recycled sari. The layer of cloth is to prevent any cracks developing in the tamarind paste. Tamarind gum is forced into the cloth before it is draped over the figure, pulling and stretching to ensure no wrinkles and minimum overlaps. To prepare the surface for painting, it is given a first coat of pure tamarind glue. and then two coats of white chalk in tamarind wash. After this is dry, the surface is finally sanded and now it is ready for painting. To create a low relief, to perfect the detail of the work, embossing fluid, a thicker version of the chalk paint, is painted on, in the layers to accentuate features. First the whole model is painted with white primer, any gold or metallic details are covered with aluminium foil, which appears in shiny silver. No other colors can be added. The choice of color is stepped in tradition. Skin tones are usually blue, yellow or red. A great detail of care is put into shading around decorative detail. The final finishing steps are to tint the silver foil gold and add black line to detail all the features. The brushes for most miniature finishing are self-made by the craftsman, consisting of bamboo sticks, thread and squirrel tail. At the end, the piece will be varnished and placed to dry.